So brief for recapitulation, G is a weak, weak shadow of F, but nonetheless a somewhat faithful representative of when, when F gets bigger, when you increase the ordinal and F gets bigger, G increases in a systematic way. Um, so, and in particular, it's, it's a much more down-to-earth function. For example, so far, even up through like F omega to the omega, which is unbelievably huge numbers, we're just talking about n to the n for the g values. And so it can be really um, helpful to kind of focus on it. Okay, but back to F though, um, just a, a few more words about why, you know, what is it that makes the values of the fast-growing hierarchy so incredibly big? Um, one of the things is is the idea of re-expansion. I'm focusing on the initial expansion procedure, where you, the first place you actually make contact with F sub zero, um, there's so much more to it than that. And um, I also want to talk about the alternation, just briefly, about the alternation of limit ordinals and successor ordinals. And those two things I think are, are good to understand is why F itself can be so big. So let me go back to F omega the omega and just kind of look at that expansion. So you, we start out with F omega to the omega of three. Um, and we started expanding it out and we get this bigger and bigger and bigger expansion. Now this one, we could actually write down the whole thing. Um, we could go ahead, let me just go ahead and copy that. I'm not going to write down, I'm going to write down a bunch of dot, dot, dots. Let's say we'll start dot, dot, dotting uh, right here. Okay. And then eventually we get to like F omega uh, squared of, uh, well, source, yeah, uh, composed with F sub 2, just kidding, squared composed with F sub 1 squared, and finally F sub 0 done three times because it's a little special. Okay. And we figured out that for this particular example, there's 27, 3 to the 3, or 20 to the 27 different things in this sequence, different distinct functions. They're all done twice. Okay. But what's making F really, really big is uh, the fact that once we even do maybe let's go ahead and do this much to it, all of that, or let's say just this much to it, that number, which is getting decently big, a lot bigger than three at any rate, gets put into an F omega, in fact, in fact two of F omegas, but even the first F omega sees the result of that calculation, and then if we wanted to, we could go ahead and re-expand that out. So what we could say, not to do too much with this, but let's say that, let's just say the result of doing all this on three is n. Okay. And then let me actually just unpack those two f omegas. Okay. Um, and so this is now, the last one in here is actually going to be f omega plus one squared. Okay. And so here n is just a shorthand, let's say n is a shorthand for these last little stages here, which are not impressive by our standards, but it's just getting the idea. Okay. And now if I wanted to concentrate on this idea of expansion and, okay, how many terms do I get when I expand, I could then say, oh, wait a minute. All right, even that f omega, okay, that's fn of n. Okay, that's fn minus 1 n times. Oh, wait a minute, that's fn minus 1 n minus 1 times, but then applied to f sub n minus 2 n times. Oh, but now I'm going to take one of those away and turn it into the next one down, etc. Okay, so if I, if I want to, I can always stop and say, oh, to evaluate this new function, the, the first unevaluated function, the first thing I haven't sort of eroded back in this sequence into, going back up like here, um, I can always think, well, you know, to actually calculate that out, I'm going to have to re-expand that out. And every time I go one to the left in this sequence of functions, it's getting, as its expansion parameter, the result of everything else applied to that, okay? So to cut to the chase to sort of the end of the story, um, let's say let M be all of this except 
the biggest function of all. So let's say we just let one of these be evaluated. So we imagine there's an oracle, or we have an, a best friend with an immense amount of time on her hands um, who calculates all of that stuff. And then what we need to calculate is simply this one last function applied, though, to this immense number m. OK. But wait a minute. OK, that's going to be a very, very similar expansion. That's going to look exactly like this, except, OK, wait, we start with just the 1, and then this is going to be plus 0. But wait a minute. These are going to turn into m minus 1s. Oh, wait a minute. Um, when I get to the next successor, let me go ahead and put that in here. Okay, this is not going to just be a 2. The omega 2 turns into omega plus omega, and omega plus omega turns into omega plus m. Now, I chip that off by 1, but still, it's plus m minus 1. Okay, and then, for example, here, oops, sorry, I did a weird scroll thing. This is going to turn into like an m minus 1, and these are all going to be, ooh, let's see, these are all going, all going to be a minus 1. So that new un unbelievably huge number goes into the re-expansion. And this is all, this is in order to create m, this process has been going on many, 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 many times, and just building up and building up and building up. Oh, and this is all, of course, of m. Okay. So it's not so much that the initial expansion is so long, which is what the g value uh, records. It's that every time I look uh, at the new function that the new the the um, the function that remains to be evaluated, the smallest function that remains to be unevaluated, I'm going to do this process over again with bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger numbers. Okay, and notice um, so that's the re-expansion process that makes f part of what makes f so much bigger than g. And then the other thing notice is this guy that anytime I get this nice alternation between successor ordinals and successors are great. Successors are what sort of fundamentally drive this process by creating many, many, many copies of the next one down. But limit ordinals are immensely powerful as well, because notice that that guy, when that guy got expanded before, it was this turning into this, just a measly omega plus 2. But now when I let a really big number be the input, omega 2 turns into omega 2 plus ginormous number. Um, and then, of course, when I unpack that, I get these these repetitions, iterations of m minus one, and it's just absolutely incredible. Okay, so that's just kind of clarifying a little bit more um, why, when g is pretty modest, like 27, um, we get a huge number. In particular, I don't want you to think, and I think this is how I don't know if this is how clear this is. I don't want you to think that like the calculation for g omega squared of three. That, or let's see, oh no, there's omega the omega, right? Yeah. The fact that g omega the omega of 3 is the number 27, that's not what makes f omega to the omega so big. It's the fact that it's exponential growth in g. And the because what happens when we re-expand is we're basically seeing a lot of new, new occurrences of the g function every time we re-expand, and we're putting in really big inputs and we get really big long re-expansions, and then we keep going and going and going. Okay, so it really is when we think about g as a proxy for f, don't think of the exact number you get for any particular calculation. Think of the growth rate of g as being the proxy uh, for the strength of, of the corresponding f. Okay, so these two processes are something to always pay attention to when you really turn your mind back to f, which is has always been our main concern. Okay, G can't really capture those amazing features, but again, you know, that's what makes it such a weak shadow. But again, we have this correlation that when, when G increases by a tiny amount, a very modest amount, F can be confidently predicted to increase amazingly. One tricky thing is that uh, G, because it's naturally so slow growing, we can kind of game the system and and we could make it look like it's growing a bit faster, significantly faster, if we chose weird choices for fundamental sequences and especially if we kind of sort of cheated and put some fast some secret fast growing stuff into the way the fundamental sequences sequences were defined um 
And so it's usually termed that G is more sensitive to the exact choice of fundamental sequences. Mainly that's because F is so incredibly big already, it's hard to actually modify it that much. G is pretty modest and you could you could sort of cheat a little bit. But as long as you use very standard choices for the fundamental sequences, it's not, I, I haven't found it to be a huge confusion, okay? Um, we will always use very, very standard ones. There's a couple of times where there's an N, an N versus N plus one kind of choice. Um, but other than that, it's going to be pretty standard. Okay, so f so far, the only G functions that I've been talking about have been really tiny. Okay, we've gone, the, the biggest thing we've done is like um, G sub omega to the omega, which is just straight up exponential growth, nothing, nothing more really. Um, and that corresponds to F omega to the omega, which uh, back in like video, I don't know, eight or something would have been tremendously impressive. By the time you get to video 14, it's, it's no longer so impressive. Okay, so we want to go further, of course. Okay, now that we've got a, a, a sense of this, this new measurement G. Um, so when do they get big, or big-ish anyway? Um, when do they get, for example, to N double up N? Um, and notice that, you know, if we do get to that point, that's something where, you know, most people start saying, oh, wow, I've never seen that function. That's big. That produces big numbers. I just have never thought about numbers that big. In that case, F should, of course, be producing absolutely huge numbers. F should be a really fast-growing function. Okay, well, this is an easy one to answer if we remember our, our trick uh, that's worked so far for, for figuring out what G of alpha is. Turns out it's a very natural place where this happens. Um, and that is, uh, if you have G of any arithmetic involving omega, remember, and you apply, apply that to N, the claim, and we haven't proved this carefully, but we'll come back to it, is that you just take all the omegas and you replace them with N. Okay, so, all right, um, we want uh, G to produce N double up N, so in other words, G should be seeing omega double up N, omega to the omega, a tower of omegas with N omegas. And using one of the two common conventions, not the one I was using, I think in videos 12 through 14, but I'm gonna switch to this, that epsilon naught, when I take G of epsilon naught of N, I'm gonna use the convention that that just gets interpreted um, as a tower of omegas with exactly N omegas in the tower. So I'm saying, in other words, that the fundamental sequence, I'm using this convention, for the fundamental sequence for epsilon naught. So for example, epsilon naught of three is gonna be omega to the omega to the omega. I think I was using the one where it was just one fewer omega before, but I, I like, this is gonna be really convenient to be able to say this for the G function. It's really easy to remember, okay? And now remember, F sub epsilon naught, right, um, is really, really big. I just did a little calculation here. Remember, if we have F of epsilon naught, this is one where I, I this is one I, I, I have to say that it's a place where part of my brain does sort of seem to shut off after this one um, in terms of really trying to understand how big this is. Um, it's such a great example to, to think about that we've really accomplished something in producing big numbers. Let's put 10 into it, for example, to get, give it some real weight. Um, so by this convention for epsilon naught, it's F of a tenfold tower of omegas applied to 10, so there's 10 omegas here. So then the first thing we would do is we'd turn that very top omega into the number 10, this guy, just this guy, okay? And then what's gonna happen? Let's think about the expansion process here. That omega to the 10 now, just kind of eroding it from the top to the bottom, is gonna turn after a bunch of, of analysis of, of limits and stuff, if finally, the, the place where it finally gets down to be a successor is omega to the 9 times 9 plus omega to the 8 times 9 plus omega to the 7 times 9. Notice how this is looking like just an, a, a base 9 expansion, or actually, no, base 10 expansion. If you just put, really, if you put in omega equals 10, this is 9 billion, 900 million, 90 million, 9 million, 9, uh, 99 plus an extra. And I wrote it as 9 plus 1 because what's that gonna do? That now activates the omega right one below it. Omega to the blah plus one is omega to the blah, that's this part, times omega. Now that gets to expand out as uh, a 10, and eventually that's going to affect the next one down in the chain, and then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, and it just becomes ridiculous, okay? We do get, in fact, a huge G value 
namely uh, g of epsilon naught, oops, of 10 is 10 double up 10, which if we, by the standards of just quadratics, cubics, even exponentials, is suddenly much, much, much bigger, okay? And so the g value is huge, but then, of course, if I really am interested in the f value, not only am I interested in how long is it going to take before this thing even gets to be a successor ordinal, and then decrement and decrement and decrement and go through successors and limits and successors and limits down to zero, that's, that's the process for figuring out g. Then there's the issue of, I've got this huge stack of functions that are waiting to be re-expressed, re-expanded, over and over and over and over again, as I was talking about at the start of this video, to produce an absolutely amazing f. Okay, so we will remember from now on how much vaster uh, the f, the fast growing is than the slow growing, but we really will focus a lot on g as this proxy. Um, as much as on, on F. So now we've gotten back to the point uh, where, I don't know, this corresponds to video 10 or something like that, where we're back at the epsilon naught level. And um, this is the end of the line for the most basic kind of ordinal arithmetic. And this is where we went on the, the track to go towards the Veblen functions. And I'm going to take you from, uh, from here onto a different track to lead you into a, a very simple example of ordinal collapsing functions, which take us at the very least beyond Veblen, and if you use them more systematically than I might tell you about, um, and more deeply, it takes you way, way beyond Veblen. Um, and that's where G's can be really helpful, because it's so much easier to talk about than F directly.